Hey everyone, welcome to Singularity Computers Custom Wiring Part 1. This is the first video in a new segment that I'm dedicating to custom wiring. It's going to be a full, detailed and ongoing custom wiring guide. I've covered custom wiring before, but I want to have a library of custom wiring information, everything that you could possibly dream of all in one place, but I also want the information to be very easy to find. So I'm going to divide it up and dedicate a video to each important aspect of custom wiring. Now I remember when custom sleeve cables were such a niche thing, hardly anyone was doing it. You'd see it in the occasional extreme build and that system would stand so far above the rest. Now it has almost become a standard for enthusiast builds and just about everyone is building their own custom cables which is just great to see. It was almost like watching the original expansion of water cooling, you know, it did happen quite quickly and so the information out there is now quite outdated, kind of lacking, it's spread out, it's difficult to find. So I really thought it was about time I started this segment. Now the videos are going to be quite random, I'm not going to do things in any specific order. You know, one video might be about the basics, the next video might be about something really advanced. And I do a lot of kind of exotic custom wiring. I like to sleeve all of my cables. And so I attempt things that, you know, other people don't normally do. So this is really going to give me the opportunity to cover a lot of different things when it comes to custom wiring. But what we're going to start with here today uh, in particular, the components that you need for custom cables, learning about all of the different pins, connectors, the wire that you need to use. It's not much different when purchasing components for a water cooling loop. I mean, the sort of information you need is quite similar. You know, when it comes to the power supply that you have, the components that you're connecting to, there is a lot to be considered. And I'm also going to start by covering the tools, which are easy enough. You just need a good, high-quality, sharp pair of scissors, wire strippers, needle nose pliers, and side cutters. And these tools, you know, it doesn't really matter what you use as long as it's decent quality. But these tools are absolutely critical. The crimpers, burner, and pin removers, in particular, the crimpers. If you don't have the right crimpers, you're not going to be able to do anything. And if you don't have a good set of crimpers, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And this can lead to serious problems, you know, shorts and problems with your system later if you don't get these crimps right. So this tool needs to be perfect. I highly recommend the MDPCX crimpers. I have a couple of sets. I've used them for many years, but right now I'm lending them out to my team. This is a set that I had as a, uh, a spare and about four years ago, I had to use them, and I just thought, wow, they work incredibly well. And it turns out, they're actually a perfect set of crimpers. The main reason is because of the shape of the, the clamps in here, the tool is very pronounced, and that shape is very important. So they get a perfect crimp every time, and the sizes are perfect. MDPCX crimpers only have two sizes. The extra size here is great, mainly for me, because I'm you know, doing all sorts of different custom cables. And I did find the two sizes on the MDPCX crimpers to be quite restrictive sometimes. So these crimpers are just perfect. I mean, they're cheap, they're generic, but just everything about them, they're short, they're lightweight, you know, they fit in your hands really nicely. And it is important that they're comfortable for you because you are going to be using them for very long hours. Now the burner. A lot of old elite sleevers will use naked flame, cigarette lighters, and that's where I started. But about five years ago, I started looking for something that was going to give me more control and more accuracy, and that was also going to be safe to use inside of a case. You know, often I'm up in a corner trying to heat heat shrink, and with a naked flame, you end up burning off the paint and running into a lot of trouble. So there was a lot of reasons I wanted something like this. And this is actually specifically designed for heat shrink. It's refillable, it will last you for years, it has a lighter casing on the inside, you can see the join there, you just pull it apart, a lot of fluid goes in and you can continue using it. And not only can you control the heat output, which is very important to get the correct heat, because that gives you a lot more control, but also being able to control the exact direction of where the heat goes is very, very useful. So mainly for beginners if you haven't had a lot of experience i highly recommend one of these 
Now the pen removers, I will use nothing but MDPCX because I've tried a couple of others in the very early days and you know the failure rate of trying to remove pins was just, you know, you'd get it one in 10 times, you'd actually get the pin out and I just ended up wasting so much time. It was frustrating, damaging pins and all of that. Now I don't actually remove a whole lot of pins per build, but still enough to warrant a good tool. And once you get one of these, you'll never need to get another one. I've had mine for eight or nine years, not this one. This is actually a new one for my team and as a spare, but just a, a perfect tool, the original pin remover and perfect success rate with, with one of these. You try to remove a pin and you know it'll come out every time. These are the MDPCX Save My Wallet Molex male and female pin removers and you know, they're just a simple tool, but they also work great. You're also going to need a soldering iron and don't get something really cheap because, yeah, it's just going to cause problems. I'd actually prefer something a lot better than this, but at least with an on-off switch on the actual soldering iron so that you can continue working because, you know, productivity is very important when you're doing cable sleeving because there's a lot to be done and it takes a lot of time. Also, the extra temperature is good. So I'm actually going to get myself something a lot better than this. Silver rosin core solder. And you're going to need a set of helping hands. I don't have mine here, but I will for future custom wiring guides, future parts of this segment. I'm now going to cover all of the information you need for choosing your components for custom cables. This is the biggest barrier for custom wiring. Once you have this figured out, the rest will fall into place and a lot of it you'll be able to figure out on your own. Because custom wiring is not really as difficult as a lot of people make it out to be. It's more just time consuming. Now first of all, you need to figure out, are you going to go full custom, modify the stock cables, or are you going to build cable extensions? Now I'm just going to be straight with you, cable extensions are pointless because it's just as difficult and time consuming to build cable extensions as it is to go full custom. But you end up with unnecessary mess, connectors where you don't need them. And one of the big reasons to do custom wiring in the first place is to remove mess, so why would you do it? There's really no place for cable extensions anymore. I think we're past that point now. There are so many people you can go to now who will build you full custom cables if you don't want to do it yourself. But if you are going to do it, do not build cable extensions because it's just as easy to go full custom and you get a far better result. So the next option is to modify the stock cables. Now, this is a PCIe cable for the Corsair AX1500i. And if I were to modify and sleeve this cable, the first thing I'd need to do is get a pin remover and remove those connectors. Then I need to split all these wires. Then I need to check the length that I need and if this was too long, I'd have to cut it down to length, strip the ends, repin them. Or if it was not long enough, I would have to solder on more wire to lengthen it, which is just absolutely pointless. Because by the time you do all of that, you could have built two fully custom cables from the ground up. Because all you need to do is cut new fresh wire, strip the ends, crimp pins on. And seriously, that's only the beginning of the problems you run into with modifying stock cables. You know, split wires and everything else that you're going to run into, it is just not worth it. If you're going to build full custom cables, you know, this is what I have always done and I'll never do it any differently. Full custom from the ground up. It gives you the great opportunity to choose the best of everything. You can choose the wire that you want, the best wire. You can choose the best pins, the best connectors, and end up with an incredibly high quality configuration that you're very proud of because you build it yourself. It gives you the opportunity to do some upgrades, and there are a lot of upgrades that you can do. First of all, let's start with the simplest of them. Most, well, as far as I know, all stock power supply cables are 18 gauge, even for the AX1500i here, these are 18 gauge. I upgrade everything to 16 gauge. Actually, not quite everything, just the cables for the core components. What I mean by this is the 24 pin, the 8 pin EPS, and a 4 pin ATX if there is one, the PCIe. So that's the main cables. All of those I upgrade to 16 gauge. And this is not really going to make much of a difference, but 
it does because I find that I can get much better crimps with this bigger sized wire. The pins have more to dig into. It just works better. You get better contact. So you have a stronger crimp with better contact. That is going to be a lot higher quality, more reliable. And also, I like the aesthetics of the 16 gauge wire. You know, the slightly bigger diameter in the sleeving makes it look a little bit more chunky. You know, you can see the slight difference. So it's also, I find it trains better. So it's a great little upgrade and I highly recommend it. Now, the other thing that you can do, pinouts are usually an absolute mess. As you can see here, this is a great example of how terrible pinouts are. You can actually go through and reorganize pinouts if you're bold enough, you know, if you know enough about it, and clean them up. Remove unnecessary split wires and all sorts of things. Now, this is something that I'll get into in later videos because it's a more advanced aspect of custom wiring. But, you know, it's just another upgrade that you can do if you're going to build your own custom cables. Let's start with choosing your wire. Now, I've used a lot of wire with insulation that is either too soft or too hard. If it's too soft, the pins pull off really easily. It's not durable. So when you're heating a heat shrink, the insulation can melt, mainly with heat shrinkless sleeving. And also, it doesn't train very well because... The insulation is kind of soft and rubbery, and when you bend the wire, it just springs back. You run into similar problems when the insulation is too hard. The pins often break, the crimps break, because they won't stick into the insulation properly. It's durable, so you don't have the melting problems, but again, you have problems with training the wire. Now, you need three different sizes. 16 gauge, 18 gauge, and 22 gauge. You need 16 gauge, for the cables for the core components, as I've mentioned, which is 24 pin PCIe, EPS and ATX. So these cables here. Now I always drop down to 18 gauge for the peripheral cables because I find that the 16 gauge wire doesn't fit very well into some of the connectors, SATA and Molex, particularly the 90 degree connectors. So I always use 18 gauge for those. Then 22 gauge is used for wiring up fans, front panel connections, lighting. So when you're calculating out how much wire you need, you can do the math. I mean, 24 pin, it's 24 wires, there's actually 23, but how long is it? Do the math. A lot of it you can figure out like that and then just add extra, estimate it, but most of it is going to be estimation because I will take you through in a future video how to get all of your cable lengths, but you can't really get all of them in advance. There's some of them that you're not going to know until a lot later in the build. For example, the lighting, which I usually install last. So a lot of that, you just need to get a lot extra, but wiring is not very costly, so it's no big deal. This is another nice little option. It's transparent insulation, silver plated copper strands, bigger strands, so you know, you can see the pattern. Looks really nice, great for a theme build. I have used it in the past. So let's move on to the sleeving and heat shrink. There's a lot of choices out there for this now. I've always used MDPCX. You can trace back my builds for years with MDPCX sleeving. I've always said the same thing about it. It's the original PC sleeve. It's 100% manufactured in Germany. Just incredible quality, great to use well designed the weave you can actually expand this to about four times its size so you know when i'm doing weird exotic cables that other people don't usually sleeve like usb3 and things like that you can get it to fit you know you can always make it fit so it's just beautiful sleeving i love the aesthetics the colors there's three different sizes that you need to become familiar with and this is generally the same no matter what sleeving you're going to be getting Small, which is used for basically everything. Then you have SATA, which is only used for SATA data. And now MDPC also has their front panel sleeve, which is kind of halfway between the small and the SATA sleeve. So, you know, this is the SATA here, the biggest one. This is the front panel here. And then the small. And the front panel is obviously used for front panel connections. You know, USB 2, USB 3, front panel audio, power and reset button, and all of that. Heat shrink is quite similar with the sizes. 
Currently MDPC has one size used in combination with the small sleeve and another used in combination with the SATA and front panel sleeve. There's a lot of different colors to choose from as well. But the MDPCX heat shrink is amazing. It's the thinnest heat shrink out there. So it's just beautiful and elegant looking. You know, it's not this massive, thick, ugly heat shrink that you see far too often. It just looks really beautiful. It's also natural, you know, made from natural products, non-toxic, and you can heat it to an extremely high temperature before it starts to melt and smoke. For your cable combs, I don't think I need to say much. It's very straightforward. The numbers just follow the cables you are going to be using them for. There are a lot of different types and brands out there now, different colors and materials and designs. But if you're wondering how many you are going to need, what I do as a general rule is halve the length of the cable and then use one every 100 millimeters for that half. Because only half of the cable, roughly, is going to be in view. And you only really need the combs where the cable is going to be in view. So about every 100 millimeters where the cable is in view. And then add a couple of extra for each cable, you know, just in case of breakages, because they are quite easy to break. You do need to be careful with them. At least the acrylic ones are. Let's take a look at the pins and connectors. I'm going to cover these at the same time because they're very closely related. This is where the most important information lies when it comes to custom wiring components. Because once you have a good understanding of what all of the different pins and connectors are used for, well, you're pretty much going to have a, a very good grasp on all of this. Let's start with the pins that you're going to be using the most of, ATX pins. Now these are used for the cables for your core components, which as I've mentioned, the 24 pin, PCIe, EPS and ATX, the cables that you're going to be using 16 gauge wire for if you listen to my recommendation. But this is where it gets a little bit more complex. Most of you are certainly going to be familiar with the connectors that plug into the components. So basically, for the ATX pins, the related connectors plug into either your motherboard or your graphics cards. So the 24 pin, the 8-pin PCIe, 6-pin PCIe, and the 8-pin EPS, and the 4-pin ATX. But with full custom cables, you also need to think about the power supply end. What connectors are used to plug into the modular connections on the power supply? And they are not necessarily going to be the same as the component end. And this power supply is a great example of that the Be Quiet Dark Power Pro 1200 watt, because if you take a look at the modular connections here, for the two 8-pin EPS or CPU power, that is 10-pin. For the PCIe, it's 12-pin. And then we have these unusual connections for the peripherals. But not all power suppliers get that complex. It's usually a lot more simple than that. For example, for Fractal, Seasonic, and Corsair, Usually the peripheral connections are 6-pin PCIe, that's what is used for them. And you can also see that here on the Corsair AX1500i. So all of the peripheral connections there are 6-pin PCIe connectors to plug into. And the CPU power and PCIe are all 8-pin EPS connectors. But then the 24-pin is always what changes. You know, on the Seasonic power supplies, it's usually an 18 pin is used for one of them. On the AX1500i, we have a 10 pin and a 14 pin. So that's where all of these other different connectors come in here. So I have 24 pin, 18, 16, 14, 12, and 10. So they are used generally for splitting up the 24 pin on all of the different power supplies. And then we have the usual ones. So we have 8 pin and 6 pin PCIe. Then we have the 8 pin EPS. Now take a look, there is only one difference between the 8 pin PCIe and 8 pin EPS. And you can easily see what it is right there. Two of the pins are actually joined. 
and we have the 4-pin ATX, which is only going to be used on some motherboards. Most motherboards just have either one or two 8-pins. This is an Enamax 12-pin connector, quite exotic. You're hardly ever going to use or see that one. Okay, so that pretty much sums up all of the connectors you're going to be using with ATX pins. Let's move on to the male versions of some of those connectors. So I have 24 pin male, 8 pin PCIe, 8 pin EPS, 6 pin PCIe, and 4 pin ATX, all male. Now these are used for cable extensions, so I'm not even going to talk about them any further, but if you do want to do cable extensions, that is where the male versions of those connectors come in. So let's move on to Molex. We have Molex female, beautiful pins, and Molex male. And the Molex male and female connectors. Let's move on to the fan connections. So we have male fan pins and female fan pins, and the male and female connectors here. Again, very straightforward. So these pins are used in combination with these connectors, and these pins in combination with these connectors. And it's just the same concept as everything else. The pin crimps onto the wire in the same way and plugs into the connectors. Front panel. So these pins here are quite similar to the ATX pins, just a lot smaller. But they fit into all of the front panel connectivity connectors, like the USB 2 front panel audio, and all of the tiny little connectors. I also actually have one of the connectors that are half the size of this somewhere around here. So, you know, power and reset buttons, hard drive and power LED, all of that. And then we have a 90 degree version of both SATA and Molex connectors, which have the pins built in. So how these work, and the wire runs through them at a 90 degree angle. You don't need to solder or even strip the wire, you just push the wire into these prongs here and it makes contact. It cuts through the insulation and makes contact. So very easy to use and great connectors when you have you know an array of hard drives or something because they're 90 degree you can have you know lots of them lined up. And that is where the different end caps come in. There are two different types of end caps and both of these connectors work exactly the same way. Same design, same concept, just one is SATA and one is Molex. So I call one of them a through cap and one of them an end cap. You use the through cap when you want to run the wires through the connector to run multiple connectors. And then on the last connector where you're not running the wire through it, you're just running the wire into it and then stopping it, you use an end cap. You can see there's only one small difference between the Molex and SATA through caps and end caps and that is that the Molex are not quite as wide, they're slightly shorter. But these just clip on and they all work the same way, whether it's the through cap or the end cap or SATA or Molex. So that's it. They just push straight on. And you can see what I mean by through cap with that one just there. And then on the Molex, I've put the end cap, which covers it all up. So, I think I've pretty much covered everything you're going to need to know about the components for custom wiring. So this is just the first of many videos to come. I already have so much in mind that I would like to cover. But that sums up this video. I hope you'll find this information useful. Thanks for watching and remember that none of this would be possible without our patrons.